What's exposing my genital? Oh, no, no, no. I got to stop myself on that one. Uh, uh, Sophie's not here. Uh, Cody <laughs> and Katie are, and hey. I am ashamed that I even tried that one. Uh, in my defense, we were talking about chat roulette. We it's were. True. Yeah. You, that... The whole context of that joke makes it better. It does. That we were just talking about because then you just let it fly real quick. But we will not be informing the listeners of the context. No. But I will inform them that my co-hosts today are Katie Stoll, Cody Johnson. Hi. Hello. Some news and even more news. That's correct. Even more news. Of it. Some more of it. Even more of it. Network. Dot com. Integer. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we were really creative when we thought mm-hmm. of these names. <laughs> yes, we are all creative geniuses. Um, well, if you have a show and you're like, I want to do that, but mm-hmm. more of it. Humble also. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Humble creative geniuses. Mm-hmm. Humble sexy creative geniuses. Humble sexy creative. Uh, humble sexy unstoppable creative geniuses. Unstoppable, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah. Powerful. Mm-hmm. We should probably add a second humble in there too. Um, <laughs> I mean, what, what we re- what we really are is uh, is news grifters. Uh, <laughs> but today we're talking about a less ethical kind of grifter. Oh. Great. Free speech grifters. Yes. But free speech is important, Robert. Oh, it is. You and know. also this is behind the bastards, the podcast where <laughs> I talk about the worst people in all of history and forget to announce things because I'm hanging out with my buds mm-hmm. and not doing my job. Not, shit, no, though, we're not doing work. Again, Sophie is not here, which is why I have a podcasting machete. <laughs> he Sophie really does. does yeah. not let me bring my 18-inch long machete. Uh, but I have it. Yep. They let you it's, fly with it. It is in your hand. Oh yeah, you can fly with machetes. You can fly with all. You can fly with guns. Fly with want, guns before. It's I want easy. you all know yeah. he's gesturing with it. And I yeah. said, when he said, "Oh yeah, you can fly with machetes," he pointed it right at me. Mm-hmm. Well, you're a good two, three feet away. It's true. Yeah, like, I don't if feel I need threatened. This, this paper. Boom. Yeah, it's I, just it's gesturing. It it's a tool. I wouldn't describe it as wildly brandishing your machete. No, 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 no because I have not started drinking. Exactly. Um, when I will be drinking is when we do our election year podcast. Right. Mm. And then I will be drunkenly gesturing with machete, perhaps at CPAC? Maybe, oh. definitely at CPAC. Maybe, definitely at CPAC. That's going to be an exciting time. You get your time. machete, I got my lanyard, we're going to oh. we're gonna have a And I've time. got my phone to record it all. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep, yeah, you can. we can name the video Machanyard. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> well, we should probably get into content that will be enjoyable for people who aren't the three of us. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not interested in the Machanyard podcast, then okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, how are you guys doing? Good. I didn't ask good. you that on this. Well, thank you. Been talking for hours already. It's true. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Good. 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 We're good. Mm. We're we're well. Mm-hmm. Cool. All right. Well, I'm gonna I'm gonna get into this. Now, yes. this is not focused around a person, uh, which is my norm, but it's yeah. focused around some people, and I think folks will find it Plural. interesting. Plural bastards. Bastards. Yeah. Over the last few years, particularly since 2016, the cause of free speech has become one of the most vicious and blood-soaked battlegrounds in our national culture war. It's a unique one, too, because while most of America's political kerfuffles revolve around issues like abortion or gun rights, where there really is little common ground, free speech is a thing that everyone, at least in theory, supports. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's weird. Say, I would say, yeah. I agree with yeah. that. Big fan, big Fran. I love I speaking mean, freely. Yeah. Big Fran, yeah. yeah. Big Fran, love shouting freely. Big mm-hmm. Fran over here with mm-hmm. her shouting. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, Big Fran loves to shout. Big Fran, uh, BF. Mm. Now, uh, in August 3rd, 2018, famous tabloid, the New York Post, published an article titled, How Liberals Turned Against Free Speech. Mm. It opens with this line. Why is it considered liberal to compel others to say or fund things they don't believe? That's a question raised by three Supreme Court decisions this year, and it's a puzzling development for those of us old enough to remember when liberals championed free speech, even advocacy of sedition, and conservatives wanted government to restrain or limit it. So that's the that's the opening of the article, and the three cases were uh, two of them were one California case overturning a statute that required anti-abortion pregnancy centers to inform clients of mm-hmm. where they could obtain abortions, uh, and the reversal of a 41 year old precedent which stated that public employees didn't have to pay union fees to cover the cost of collective bargaining, and the third was one of those stupid fucking cases about a Christian bakery not wanting to of course, make yeah. for gay people. Classic. So at least one a year. All of yeah. these stories confuse me as to how like that abortion thing. What about that's free speech? Like. <laughs> Not informing. Anyway, continue. that's a great question, Katie. <laughs> that's a great question. I'm gonna I'm gonna dig into that one. A little oh, good. Bit in specific. Um, but I do want to note that the Post article quotes uh, Neil Ferguson, who argues that liberals are increasingly authoritarian, and it ends on this line: 
Like the liberal Supreme Court justices who see no constitutional problem with compelling crisis pregnancy centers to send messages they find repugnant or requiring union members to subsidize political speech they disagree with or forcing people to participate in ceremonies prohibited by their religion, they seem not to have noticed Yale Law Professor Stephen Carter's observation that every law is violent because behind every exercise of law stands the sheriff. Carter calls for a degree of humility in passing and enforcing laws that compel speech against conscience, something today's liberals seem to have forgotten. Liberals is in quotation marks. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. yeah, you got to get those scare quotes yeah, in. Yeah, you got to yeah. get those fucking square quotes in. Yeah, so it's easy to see. I, you can see, I can see how someone might be con- convinced by that line of reasoning. Um, like if uh, if someone believes abortion is wrong and they open a clinic to help pregnant women in crisis, it's good to help pregnant women in crisis. And people who think abortion is wrong shouldn't be required to push people towards abortion doctors. That's an argument you could make, and it's an argument that if you have exactly that much evidence available mm-hmm. to you, as I, there's logic to it. Yeah, yeah. On the surface, that on the surface. makes right. sense. Yeah. Now, when you read a little bit more into these centers, it becomes easier to see the authoritarian uh, liberal argument as to why that maybe doesn't uh, include all of the Hmm. relevant facts. I'm going to quote from a report by the AMA, famed liberal lobbying group, All of the Doctors. (laughs) Drive down any highway in America and you might see a sign. Pregnant, scared, called 1 800 5, you know, phone number. Most <laughs> often, these signs are advertisements for crisis pregnancy centers, CPCs. CPCs, sometimes known as pregnancy resource centers, pregnancy care centers, pregnancy support centers, or simply pregnancy centers, are organizations that seek to intercept women with unintended or crisis pregnancies who might be considering abortion. And then, a little further down, it notes, CPCs, as a rule, not only discourage abortion, but also refuse to provide referrals to abortion clinics, although they often provide counseling about dangers associated with premarital sexual activity. Women who visit CPCs typically do not realize that they are not in an abortion clinic and are surprised to find that abortion is not considered an option at these centers. As obstetrician-gynecologists, we have had several disgruntled patients come to us who were disappointed and felt deceived by the care that they had received at CPCs. Mm-hmm. So you see, it's not as, it's not not quite as simple as uh, these good, right. do-gooders mm. being forced to speak against their will. It's uh, somebody dressing up a religious mission as a medical. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Um, cool. So, if you're pregnant mm-hmm. and you go there and you uh, feel like you're in crisis and you're pregnant, uh, one of their solutions is to teach about the dangers of uh, premarital sex. Premarital sex. Yeah. Like, is that effective that to the pregnant That sailed. Woman? <laughs> well, it's, it's kind of like if you go into uh, the doctor with lung cancer after a life of smoking, the doctors will say, well, have you tried not fucking smoking? You know, smoking's bad for you. Yeah, you know, you know, know those cigarettes aren't good for you. Let me uh, put on this film strip real quick yeah. about how smoking is bad. Not doing you no favors. Mm, I love doctors that are mm-hmm. helpful. Yeah. There's a lollipop on your way. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know that specific story bugs me <laughs> yeah it's frustrating that's why that's the one i chose to focus on um because it frustrated me too um so yeah see if, if you read into it a little bit it becomes clear that despite how it was framed by the new york post this is not a pro or anti-free speech argument instead it's an argument over whether or not religious organizations should be allowed to masquerade fraudulently as medical practitioners and lie about health care options mm. which is maybe maybe a little different than seems free a little speech. different seems, seems like yeah. not quite the free yeah. speech just, issue just yeah. a smidge maybe <laughs> Mumble, mumble. Mm, Mumble, mumble. Mm, mm. Now, the fight over crisis pregnancy counseling centers is emblematic of the broader debate over free speech currently consuming our national discourse. Take a serious political issue that has nothing to do with the First Amendment, wrap it in that cloak, and tar the other side for being anti-free speech so they have to defend themselves on that front rather than actually debate you over the harms of what you're doing. Mm. Mm -hmm. It's a cool strategy. Yeah. Smart. Works. It's like if you're hunting a deer, instead of camouflaging yourself, you dress yourself up as another deer, but with a gun for a mouth. Oh, yeah. This may not, in fact, be an analogy. It's uh-huh. perfect. Then you got to argue with that gun mouth deer, right? Yeah. Instead of, well, you're clearly you're a hunter and you're not a gun mouth deer, mm-hmm. but now I'm. I want to debate that gun mouthed deer. Well, and you know that old, that old, that old uh, chestnut of country wisdom. Nobody ever wins a debate with a gun mouthed deer. Well, you can't yeah. because as soon as he tries to talk, a bullet shoots out of him. Exactly, mouth. exactly, mm-hmm. exactly. Hey, that's a good, uh, good argument from the gun mouthed deer. Thank you for embracing my. I still don't think it's an analogy. Your perfect I mean, I, analogy? My perfect analogy. <laughs> I've definitely yeah. lost the thread, but I'm on board. Thank you. Thank you. Also, just full disclosure, I mix up analogies and similes sure. constantly. Yeah, I, mm-hmm. Me too. Mm-hmm. Metaphors, all of it. Metaphors. Oh, my God. Participles. Yeah. Dangling. Those aren't related at all. No. 
Mm. No, they're not. But they, it makes me uncomfortable to think about things dangling. No. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Particularly participles. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, uh, the free speech grift, as it's been coined by some critics, has risen to become the centerpiece of right-wing politics because it is so much easier than actually arguing the merits of aggressive policies on abortion, racial justice, or anything else. It is a brilliant strategy because it allows them to co-opt the support of a sizable number of moderates and liberals who are either too dumb to see what's happening or who are eager to capitalize on the grift themselves. In fact, the origins of our modern free speech grift trace back to a 2015 article in The Atlantic titled The Coddling of the American Mind. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you yes, like you like yes, that. Yes, I love these. Yeah, you're almost touching your nipples, Cody. Yeah, I'm very excited. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, the article written by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt. Uh, Or the article is written by Greg Lukianoff and Jonathan Haidt, and the thrust of it is that political correctness has completely overtaken American campuses, ushering in a terrifying (laughs) new era where art is censored and language is destroyed to please howling hordes of liberal zombies. God. (laughs) I'm so obsessed with these college campuses. They are. Big fans of college campuses. You know how, like, Mm -hmm. college is where, like... You learn and like you do some dumb stuff and like maybe you make things uh, out to be more than they are and yeah. then you sort of grow out of it and then like you go into the world. Yeah, maybe you try. Yeah, maybe you, you put cocaine up your butt a couple of times. You realize maybe. that's not good and then you <laughs> go into the world and you snort cocaine like an adult. My oh point my is that's how it's done. That's how it's done. This is the one problem facing America today. Yes. that's what I was getting at. <laughs> college campuses, These college campuses, yeah. and PC culture, mm-hmm. and PC mm-hmm. culture. You know, let's not try to be courteous and mm. uh, empathetic to mm-hmm. other people. Let's not try to listen to other people mm. and their perspectives. No, let's just fuck them. Because mm. it's it's violence to me if you say that uh, kind of made me feel bad. Yeah. That's, that's, I'm, that's, deeply, that's I'm deeply offended. Whoa. I'm deeply offended that I offended you. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to quote from the article. Hmm. For example, some students have called for warnings that Chinua Achebe's Things Fall Apart describes racial violence and that F. Scott Fitzgerald's The Great Gatsby portrays misogyny and physical abuse so that students who have been previously victimized by racism or domestic violence can choose to avoid these works, which they believe might trigger a recurrence of past trauma. Some recent campus actions border on the surreal. In April, at Brandeis University, the Asian American Student Association sought to raise awareness of microaggressions against Asians through an installation on the steps of an academic hall. The installation gave examples of microaggressions such as aren't you supposed to be good at math and I'm colorblind I don't see race but a backlash arose among other Asian American students who felt that the display itself was a microaggression the association removed the installation and its president wrote an email to the entire student body apologizing to anyone who was triggered or hurt by the content of the microaggressions so that's the that's the that's the what they're what they're what they're complaining about is the, the coddling of the American mind yeah like that sort of stuff um, okay that um that one small story mm-hmm. um, has changed my mind about this. <laughs> about this issue. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah. The, see, the, the, that's what they do in the articles. They pick out a couple of, of stories where it's pretty easy. Okay, yeah, that's a group of that's a group of people maybe behaving in a way that I would consider a little bit unreasonable, mm-hmm. or like that's or at least the way that it's characterized makes it seems like they might right. be a little unreasonable. But it's not. Interestingly enough, for logic ration people like the folks who tend to be on this grift, it doesn't delve much into actual. I just tap my papers mm-hmm. on the table for influence. Mm-hmm. Uh, statistics mm. to tell us maybe if this is a broad right. problem or not. Sure. Oh, that information is available. I wonder if that information is available. It is. Oh, uh, and you have it right here? I do have it right here, uh, courtesy of I didn't do the research myself, uh, being a hack and a fraud, but mm-hmm. I did find <laughs> the research done by the Niskanen Center, a nonpartisan think tank dedicated to fostering an open society. Uh, they collected data from a number of studies on the beliefs of the I generation, a.k.a. Generation Z, a.k.a. the kids who are in high school and college currently. Mm-hmm. Okay. And it turns out these kids are less likely to strongly favor free speech bans than any other age group. Mm. So actually, kids in college right now are the least likely to support any restrictions on freedom of speech. Interesting. Interesting. Quote, A decade of data from the Knight Foundation on high school students tells a similar story. Support for the First Amendment is currently at its strongest level, yet recorded, with a majority of high schoolers, 56%, disagreeing with the statement, the First Amendment goes too far in the rights it protects. Note that there is no change during the years when iGen would be entering high school. And contrary to Haight's theory about the relationship between social media and free speech, the Knight Foundation survey also found that high schoolers who actively engage with news on social media, discussing stories, posting comments, and linking to articles, consistently demonstrate greater support for free speech. Not Mm. Less. Interesting. 
Huh. So maybe uh, taking isolated incidents that mm-hmm. are sort mm-hmm. of like charged with emotion. Yeah, of uh, the thousands and thousands of mm-hmm, campuses mm-hmm, in the country mm-hmm. and hundreds of thousands of students. And then pinpointing and saying like, yeah. this is a, a, a nationwide This is every problem. college. This yeah. is all of maybe them. Maybe that's and not we gotta, scientific. Yeah. yeah. Maybe it's complete nonsense. Maybe it's intellectually maybe it dim. Is. Yeah. Maybe it's just lying. Mm. Can we say lying on a podcast? I think we can. Well, you can bleep it. We can bleep it. You we know, can bleep it. You know, I'm going to make a bleeping noise by hitting this empty LaCroix can with a machete, and we can just, we can put that in a post. This is a good idea. Don't worry. It's fine. Can we, we'll, we'll post that. Mm-hmm. Great. Everybody good? It's the best bleep I've ever heard. Thank you. <laughs> okay. And now you've got a place to put your knife. I know. No, it's a nice, oh, yeah, it's a nice little machete holder. Yeah. Mm. Mm-hmm. Oh, you made a little Every, pocket for it. Yeah. Everything works out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I like that about the world. Now, uh, the Niskanen Center uh, summary also notes uh, that in a later article, Haight and another writer cite that 2017 Knight Foundation study that was just uh, quoted above to make the same point, (coughs) noting a rise in the number of college students who say the climate on my campus prevents some people from saying things they believe because others might find them offensive. The rise is from 54% in 2016 to 61% in 2017. But... Haight and his co-author neglect to mention that 2016 and 2017 are the only years for which data on that question is available, making it essentially meaningless as a way to (laughs) identify a trend. Mm. They also insinuate that this increase in censorship is driven by liberal and leftist students. However, quote, this increase is being driven by perceptions of self-censorship among Democrats and independents. The number of Republican students who reported a censorious climate on campus actually dropped from 62% to 53%. (laughs) That's wild. Cool. (laughs) Uh, <laughs> you love to laugh. You love intellectual you gotta laugh. honesty. Yeah. yeah. Um, this is uh, wholly unsurprising. I don't think I've seen this uh, data you're referring to. I saw a similar report about yeah. this. And There's how... actually quite a lot of data on this. Data, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, and basically, yeah, saying the same thing that like uh, the perception is actually the opposite of reality. Yeah. And uh, and this like you can see this kind of generally throughout history of like, mm-hmm. no, uh, a lot of the left gets censored. People uh, who actually want society to change in ma- massive fundamental ways often censor themselves. Often. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, even just like professors, like yeah. left-wing professors get uh, censored a lot more than any of these people. And We'll get into that. Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. Now, that Niskanen study does also note that according to a 2017 YouGov study, conservative students were more likely to report censoring themselves in the classroom, 60% versus 53%, and outside of it, 47% versus 40%. But even this data does not tell the entire story. A survey conducted by Cato and YouGov notes that 58% of Americans nationwide report self-censoring their views among other people. Conservative college students are actually less likely to report censoring themselves than conservative Americans outside of colleges. And liberals on college campuses censor themselves more often than liberals in the general population. It's, um, so, so are, you, are you suggesting that, that it's the opposite again? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Is that, okay. Maybe, maybe a little bit the opposite. Okay. Okay. Maybe I'm just clarifying. I, I, I'm just clarifying. Thank you for the clarity is important. God. Again, wholly unsurprising. Yeah. So in other words, the entire story of free speech suppression on American college campuses is a lie. The reality is literally the opposite. Yet in spite of this, right wing groups like Turning Point USA. Hooray. Cody's my, favorite. My favorite my favorite fellows. Yeah, have raised hundreds of thousands of dollars to influence political elections on college campuses and crusade against safe spaces at their campus clash events. Uh, their 2019 tour includes speakers like TP USA founder Charlie Kirk. Donald Trump Jr., Candace Owens, and Kyle Kashuv, who recently got his Harvard invitation rescinded for writing racial slurs in several text messages to classmates mm. in an open Google Doc. <laughs> cool. Are you suggesting that the uh, president's son is being censored? Oh, yeah. That yeah. poor guy never saying, gets to speak. You're saying that the president's to... son has a free speech problem? It must God. suck to be the president's son mm-hmm. and to be so rich. Mm-hmm. It, it's a Maybe shame when uh, millionaires funded by billionaires uh, just say lies. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and someone like gets angry at them. Someone gets angry. And that is the death of free speech. Mm-hmm. Someone mm-hmm. getting angry at a millionaire being paid yeah. by billionaires yeah. to lie. Lying. That's being, censorship. That's censorship. It's Criticism oppression. is censorship. It's oppression, guys. Call mm-hmm. it what it is. Yeah. I should also note that free speech bastion TPUSA donors include such luminaries as Greg Gianforte, who mm. assaulted a Guardian journalist for asking him questions. Yes, I didn't did. know Greg was involved with oh, TPUSA. Oh, he sure is. He's given them thousands and thousands of dollars. Oh, of course he is. Free that speech makes warrior. Only the, the 
guy who sense. assaulted a journalist. For asking a question. Mm-hmm. You guys want to hear an unrelated quote from Thomas Jefferson? Yeah. Absolutely. Were it left to me to decide whether we should have a government without newspapers or newspapers without a government, I should not hesitate a moment to prefer the latter. Huh. Mm, interesting. <laughs> 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 you know what goes well with those <laughs> gestures? Products. Services also. But and yes, services. products. Yes, you were right, Katie. You nailed it. I was it. so excited to get one right. You did. You got it. You nailed it. I've won. Would you like to throw in a free ad for something? Uh, this is your this is your time. This I'd is like, your time in here. Well, right now I'm craving gummy bears, so I'd like to throw in an ad for gummy bears. The concept of gummy bears. Yeah. Bouncing, hippity hopping and all around uh-huh. the the forest fantastic filled with juicy flavors mm-hmm. oh juicy flavors gummy bears filled with juicy flavors i love eating candy i find in the forest yeah forest candy <laughs> forest candy it's the best kind of candy <laughs> well also it's when you want it the most like i imagine you oh yeah hungry in the forest mm-hmm. and you're not sure when you're gonna have another snack you a little sugar rush i was out you camping sugar rush. with some friends years back in the texas in the summer and we had a big bag of gummy candy and we left it outside and it all melted together into one giant oh. like four pound like ball of yeah. it's so good we mm-hmm. just, just pour it slice nose. it up yeah it <laughs> uh-huh. beautiful oh fucking so tasty mm. all the flavors in one well, if you want all the flavors in one, buy the products advertised. <laughs> We're back Whoa. after a flawless ad pivot. Really, thank you, Katie. Oh, you're you know what? You're welcome. You're mm. you're so much I'm better. I'm so than good me. at this. You are. You nailed it. Humbly good. Humbly good. <laughs> Humbly good. Uh, yeah, so Turning Point USA doesn't just sponsor speeches and debates on college campuses to foster free speech. They also compile and maintain a professor watch list, which is definitely a thing that sounds yes, good for free speech, you. is a we'll watch list of professors. Yes. Yeah. Typical of the list is the entry for Professor Betsy Stevenson. Quote, Betsy Stevenson is an associate professor of economics at the University of Michigan. Stevenson made the list after making the claim that the lack of women found in economics textbooks is the reason so few women pursue economics as a major. In a study she conducted with Hannah Zlotnick, she found that 77% of people found in the leading economics textbooks were male. That sounds like a reason to be on a watch list. <laughs> Fire that woman. Fire, Fire that her. woman for her research and speech. Fire Unbelievable. her. Yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, this, it's, uh, ooh, uh, now, maybe it's a watch list of good researchers doing cool stuff. <laughs> That's true. Maybe I should read the next paragraph. Maybe you should. Maybe I should. I can't agree with you more. <laughs> when the watch list was originally created in November of 2016, TPUSA writer Matt Lamb described its purpose thusly. We aim to post professors who have records of targeting students for their viewpoints, forcing students to adopt a certain perspective, and or abuse or harm students in any way for standing up for their beliefs. Ah, okay then. Uh, Do you want to read your example again from earlier? My God. (laughs) Well, she... Sensitive little dweeb. She claimed that women were unrepresented in economics textbooks and then proved it with rigorous data. Well, that's threatening all the male exactly. students I'm a that hurt are future students now. there. I feel attacked, and I think you should apologize to us both, Katie. Because I'm a woman? Exactly. I refuse. Wow. I I'm think, even more I think, offended. I think I know a watch list you're going <laughs> I... I've always wanted to be on a watch list. <laughs> I feel the need to now to join Turning Point USA, mm-hmm. which incidentally has a history really of hiring easy to racists racists you. and then having to fire them. <laughs> yes, it sure yes, does. Yes, it does. I feel the need to go up to Greg Gianforte, ask him a question, and get hit in the face. Uh, well, that's uh, that, what I'll you're leave describing. that to you. Yeah, I'll get on a watch list. Freedom of speech. We can we'll all do TPA. different parts of it. Yeah, we're all we're all just different free speeches. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. <laughs> that Nick Cannon study also looked into the frequency with which college uh, faculty members are fired due to criticism from the left and the right. Mm. The results are fascinating, and mm. I'd like to quote from that study again. To begin to answer this question, I gathered together all cases from 2015 to 2017 involving, number one, a faculty member at an American degree-granting post-secondary nonprofit institution who was fired slash resigned as part of a settlement or demoted denied promotion due to speech that perceived by critics as political. Okay, seems reasonable. Mm-hmm. Okay. What remains are 45 cases from 2015 to 2017 where a faculty member was fired, resigned, or demoted, denied promotion due to speech deemed by critics as political. Of these, more than half, 26, occurred in 2017. The clear majority, 19, being over liberal speech. This disparity persists even after removing terminations occurring in private religious institutions. For liberals, the most common types of speech to result in termination were those perceived by critics as anti-white or anti-Christian. For conservatives, they were anti-minority or anti-diversity. 
Now, because they're diligent, Ms. Cannon notes that the higher frequency of professors being canned for left-wing speech may have more to do with the fact that there are more left-wing professors than right-wing professors. Sure. That is sure. absolutely a factor. Because mm-hmm. um, so, well, they're educated. Because they're, mm-hmm. <laughs> they're like, let's not be mean with our facts. <laughs> yeah. Facts. Our facts do care about their feelings. Yeah. Okay. I got okay. a, I, I got a D on my history paper because I'm conservative. That's why. <laughs> yeah, my, my history paper was just why was Hitler the bad guy? Right. <laughs> <laughs> he shouted at the people I shout at. Yeah, I wrote a whole thing about how the Civil War was only about states' rights, and they gave me a D, and I was like, "What? Is it because of my I voted Republican?" Mm-hmm. It's censorship. I agree. It's censorship because as far as I'm aware, there was never any slavery in the South. I learned that from um, my sheltered upbringing, yeah. I guess. <laughs> well, you know, I my history textbook went from the founding of, of humanity to 1491 and then started right back up again in 1989. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Somebody You get all the key parts, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Skip the nonsense. <laughs> skip, right, skip, the, skip all that bullshit. Yeah, get right back into the good stuff. Right into the roaring eighties. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, while there's no evidence that conservative voices are being silenced in academia, uh, this data does not necessarily suggest that the opposite is happening. However, quote, the size of the disparity in 2017 bears watching as it may mark the beginning of a trend in precarious liberal speech. A proper assessment would also need to take stock of the data categorization issues surrounding religious institutions where terminations for political speech are especially difficult to capture. So, like actual researchers Mm. who care about facts... Even when they have a lot of data, the Niskanen people uh, hesitate to draw conclusions that are overly broad based on the information they have because they're trying to do actual research as opposed to picking out a single issue on a single campus Mm. and saying, look at what these liberals are doing to free speech. Well, now I don't know what to think. Now you don't know. These seem like two equally credible people. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, on the one hand, whatever dumb shit you said. (laughs) On the other hand, this report. So. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? We joined Mm -hmm. TPUSA. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Now, while we're on the subject of professors, we should probably talk a little bit about Cody's favorite professor. Oh, Oh, you know know his his name? Dr. Jordan fucking Peters. Yeah, I, I was love like, your air horns. <laughs> I was waiting because as soon as you said, said Professor Watchlist, I'm like, yo. Here, here it comes. Here it comes. <laughs> yeah, it was the only person to talk to about after this. Yeah. yeah. Now, Dr. Professor Peterson mm-hmm. describes himself. Jordan Balthazar Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Balthazar? It's not Balthazar. Bad Boy Peterson. Jordan, bad boy yeah. Peterson. He describes himself as, quote, a classic British liberal who defends individual freedom from collectivists. Now, he has a particular hatred for the Ontario Institute for the Studies of Education. The organization's mission statement seems mild enough, which is, you know, a little bit confusing. uh, It says that its goal is to prepare scholars, teachers, and other professional leaders to be equipped with the skills and global awareness required by an increasingly challenging and complex society, ready to influence policy and practice in their fields. But Peterson takes issue with what I suspect is that last line, claiming the OISE is basically a training ground for dastardly social justice warriors. (laughs) <laughs> Sorry. Uh, in a 2017 interview with Epic Times, he stated, The Ontario Institute for the Studies of Education, that bloody thing is a fifth column. The people who are producing the educators that emerge from that institute, they should be put on trial for treason. Like, it's serious stuff. The idea is that the purpose of education is to get them while they're young, in kindergartens, so that this radical postmodern Marxist ideology can be so thoroughly inculcated when they're young, they have no chance of escaping from it. And that's what's happening in the education system. This paranoid maniac. <laughs> They Cody? need to be tried for treason. As yeah. Robert was reading that. Be precise that, in your speech. Cody takes off his glasses mm-hmm. and like puts his head in his hands mm-hmm. just so everyone has the visual. I have a, you know, you know how, you know, when you play like an Xbox and you're playing a video game and they've, they've got all these different like little awards you can win for doing yeah, the sure. shit, shooting 10 people in the head or whatever. My, my one for this podcast is going to be giving Cody an embolism. Yeah. <laughs> it's, like, it's getting there. God. That uh, quote, yeah, man, oh, oh, mm-hmm. it's his entire self in one sentence. Yeah, yeah. These people are teaching things I don't like. They should be on trial for Tried treason. Tried for treason. I love free speech. This is like, 
<laughs> and oh, was, ooh. yeah, yeah. Now, feelings. <laughs> additionally, back in 2017, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation reported that Dr. Professor Jordan Peterson planned to build a website listing university courses in Canada that had what he claimed were postmodern neo-Marxist course content. Mm-hmm. He told CTV, "We're going to start with a website in the next month and a half that will be designed to help students and parents identify postmodern content and courses so that they can avoid them." Yeah. <laughs> now, this created a bit of an uproar, according to the website Inside Higher Education. Quote, in a YouTube video posted to his personal account, he highlighted English literature, anthropology, sociology, women's studies, and ethnic studies as the types of courses that, quote, that have to go. Mm-hmm. Professors at the University oh of Toronto God. expressed concern that they would be targeted by such a list, which also led to fears of harassment. Instructors of the potentially targeted courses believe that their autonomy as educators may be under threat. The proposed website has created a climate of fear and intimidation, the University of Toronto Faculty Association said in a statement to Canadian media. Now, shortly uh, thereafter, <laughs> free speech warrior Dr. Professor Jordan Peterson, Professor Doctor, announced on Twitter that he had shelved for now his plans to build a website listing courses he thought should be banned. Like women's studies. Oh, good. I, yeah. Jeez. I was about to ask you, you did say women's oh, studies, yeah. right? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Who would need to study women? You did say anthropology, right? Yes. Also sociology. Oh, my God. Also um, ethnic studies. Jesus. Also English liter English should literature. Be banned. It doesn't. The fact the, they that don't it, should not should be banned. Have to go. Have, have to, to go. go. Okay, have let's have not say go. banned. That would be the wrong word. Banned. Mm-hmm. Um, have to go. Well, it sounds like go. he's being censored for his. Uh, and we should be plan. taking him seriously. Famous yeah. censored millionaire, Doctor Professor Jordan Peterson, <sighs> who only eats meat. Who only eats who meat. Only eats beef and salt <laughs> and water. Whose poops, I'm sure, are fascinating. Unbelievable. Um, Jordan, they, they are unbelievable poops. Yeah, they're un, <laughs> you, unfathomable poops he's got. Um, this is the man who um, had literal apocalyptic dreams mm-hmm. about mm-hmm. the end of the world and wanted to start a church uh, and believes that uh, his wife has prophetic dreams that he is the special boy who's going to save the world from uh, destabilization and destruction. I'm not making this up. Now, In a different era, that- this man, while he is scary, would be a worldwide threat of some sort. Yeah, it sounds a little... I don't want to say Hitlery. But, you know, but that's what I was going at. Dreams of you saving the world from a yes. uh, from destabilizing. A guy. One could yeah. say cultural Marxism. He might have a different word for it. Yeah, savior syndrome type thing. Because mm-hmm. uh, there's a natural Actually, there's a natural order. Um, I, I think we need to spell out really directly why you and I see Nazi parallels and some of what's going on because it is a little bit obscured. I had actually an argument with this about my dad recently okay, because he doesn't yeah. understand like the. When people talk about cultural Marxism, um, when they when that is, which is a big thing for Jordan, Peterson, yeah, that's what he's it? saying. Yeah, that's, that's what he's saying. He said, he said it before. Yeah, like, what, what's the exact wording he uses? He says postmodern neo Marxism, and he, he like he talks about how they switched it and stuff like yeah. that. But there are other clips of him talking about literally cultural Marxism and stuff. Yeah, like mm-hmm. that, so. yeah. So it, like he clearly used one term and then switched to another term. The idea of cultural Marxism comes from fucking Nazi propaganda in the twenties and thirties right. when they called it Kultur Bolshevismos yeah. or something like that. Uh, and the idea was both that Marxism was infiltrated infiltrating society and specifically that it was infiltrating society through the Jews who mm. were trying to like undermine this is why we we see when we make snide comments about Dr. Jordan Peterson yeah. made him being kind of fascist we're not like reaching super far Th- there was this ideology that was th- this attitude of cultural Marxism that it's a thing that exists that was created by the Nazis to justify what they did to the Jews. And then a new generation of people has just sort of cut the Jews out of uh, right. Judea, right. cut the Judeo out of Judeo Bolshevism, but they're like, no, there's still cultural Bolshevism. Yes, Bolshevism it's, still a it's thing. now like yeah. it's like the liberal academia and the left, like radical leftists and their cultural, yeah. like, and hol- like it's a. Uh, uh, an amalgam of, of these groups that are doing this instead of just the Jews. Yeah. Um, and uh, it's v- the it's the worrisome. Line, yeah, yeah. The line is very clear, and like it's it's one of those things where like, no, Jordan Peterson isn't a Nazi. He would have been. <laughs> he would have been. Yeah, but it's not even. And it, so there's that. But even beyond that, someone that says that, oh, my wife had a prophetic dream that I am this oh, savior yeah. type person, or someone that says, you know what? Yeah. Only eating meat, that'll cure depression. And I want to open a, a church. Grift. I want to like, open a church. Uh, we need to ban women's studies, ethnic oh, yeah. studies. That is Anthropology. <laughs> Anthropology. <laughs> Which is just, like, that's absolutely nuts. So that's somebody that's a, a maniac. I don't know how else you describe it. I mean, it. And if you get into power, this person gets into a power, it's terrifying. Yeah, I, he's got, yeah. I, I don't want to oversell the state of the threat, but if Dr. Jordan Peterson gets his way, we will lose the best season of Community. Mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Are we really 
willing to. We're no, no, absolutely no, not. We fucking no, aren't. We're, no, 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 no. But it's a good show. <laughs> it's a great, it's a great show. Yeah, it ended on a high note. Really? Yeah, 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 that was actually really. Except really Donald Glover's gone, but yeah, that was sad. That was sad. But they really did a good really job. Good. Yeah, but now yeah. you got. Um, Oh yeah, no. The, both of the, all the actors they yeah, brought in for the no, six seasons, six seasons I enjoyed. Are amazing. Yeah, yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. Writing is perfect. It's mm-hmm. good. It's yeah, good. It's really, really, yeah. Nice note. Tears me up a little bit every time. Mm. Yeah. Okay. This yeah. <laughs> is we've gotten well off of track here. <laughs> now let's talk about free speech warrior uh, Dr. Jordan Peterson, yes, who is yes. a big fan of free speech. Mm-hmm. Big fan of free speech. Clearly, got, clearly, got to go. yeah. Clearly, huge yeah. lover of free speech. In June of 2019, the doctor professor was invited to speak at the Brain Bar in Budapest <laughs> by Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban. Mr. Orban wanted to speak with the doctor professor about current political issues. According to New York Magazine, quote, the Orban-friendly news outlet Hungary Today described their meeting as an amiable conversation about the dangers of illegal immigration, political correctness, and John Claude Juncker's apology is for Karl Marx. Peterson and Orban also touched on a current tendency to minimize the crimes committed under communist regimes. They cited an infamous speech by European Commission President Jean Claude Juncker in which they said he defended Karl Marx. Now, if you lean a little bit more towards the conservative end of the spectrum and you have not kept a pace with Hungarian politics, you may not immediately see what's so fucked up about this. Mm. Viktor Orban is an avowed advocate of what he calls illiberal democracy, <laughs> aka not, not really democracy, democracy at all. Yeah. Illiberal. Illiberal. In his 2018 acceptance speech, he declared an end to the era of liberal democracy. We have replaced a shipwrecked liberal democracy with a 21st century Christian democracy, which guarantees people's freedom, security. It supports the traditional family motto of model of one man and one woman, keeps anti-Semitism at bay, and gives a chance for growth. Hmm. Cute. Mm. Free speech lover Victor Orban. Yeah. Now, after his election, he passed a series of punitive laws and launched a propaganda campaign that forced the Central European University to withdraw from his country. New York Magazine describes them as a liberal institution whose avowed purpose was to protect the open society from, a th- from authoritarianism of the right or left. They also note that at the nation's remaining colleges, Orban has banned fields of study that conflict with the state's conception of truth. And while Orban identifies as an illiberal Democrat, his party has insulated its power against the threat of popular rebuke to such a degree that many scholars describe his regime as as a creeping dictatorship. Cool. Now, in a 2018 interview, Dr. Peterson himself agreed that Hungary's assaults on academic freedom were unacceptable. Yet he agreed to sit down with Orban and have a convivial talk about the danger of cultural Marxism. Meanwhile, Peterson decried the idea that people ought to accept different gender pronouns for trans and non-binary people as being dangerously in line with, quote, the Marxist doctrines that killed at least 100 million people in the 20th century. What? What? (laughs) (laughs) Dr. Professor Jordan Peterson there. Uh, expert on um, the world. The world. <laughs> um, it's so interesting to hear him talk about really this is. stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's like one of those things. Where like, you don't hear him talk about the other side of this. Um, or the people that die from uh, fascist. Fascism. The extension of sort of mm-hmm. what he espouses. Um, of course, you not. don't. It's just interesting. It's uh, only communism has killed people. Um, on a... He doesn't feel compelled to talk about that. It's his right. Mm-hmm. It's as his right. As a free right. speech warrior. As a free speech warrior. Um, point of order, uh, Jordan B. Peterson, who's a clinical psychologist. Dr. Professor. Dr. Professor Jordan yeah. B. Peterson, a uh, clinical psychologist, um, has on more than one occasion uh, on camera claimed to be an evolutionary biologist <laughs> um, and a neuroscientist. <laughs> Uh, two things he is not. Uh, two things that a respectable, uh, say, professor or doctor wouldn't claim to be if they were not. Mm-hmm. Um, it seems like perhaps he's uh, adult, dishonest, dishonest. Okay, so that might be uh, that might, that might be possible. Also, he's once asked if he supported gay marriage. Uh, the cultural Marxists are supporting, and he's like, "Well, if cultural Marxists support it, I wouldn't support it." So, oh, cool, very cool. That's a solid intellectual line to take. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Now, earlier in this episode, when we started talking about the good doctor, I noted that he identifies personally as a classic British liberal. You probably heard that, Kate, Cody. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is not an uncommon statement from intellectual figures on the right. Many of them identify as classical liberals. Mm-hmm. When they do so, they are putting themselves in line with an intellectual tradition that is descended in large part from a 19th century philosopher and British member of parliament named John Stuart Mill. In his influential essay, On Liberty, Mill wrote this. There ought to exist the fullest liberty of professing and discussing as a matter of ethical conviction any doctrine, however immoral it may be considered. If all mankind minus one were of one opinion and only one person were of the contrary opinion, mankind would be no more justified in silencing that one person than he, if he had the power, would be justified in silencing mankind. Mm. Now, 
When classical liberals like Peterson talk about free speech, they are calling upon the ideas they inherited from Mill, or at least the ideas they believe they inherited from Mill. I found a great article about this on The Conversation titled The Strange o Origins of Free Speech Warriors. Quote, In truth, thinkers such as Mill were far from being libertarians, and what's more, would never have embraced the borderline absolutist position of today's free speech warriors. Based in what is called the harm principle, Mill argued for a big government approach to, situa <laughs> to situations in which the exercise of liberty might result in harm to others or even to the individual practicing it. In On Liberty, he argues that parents of poor moral fiber may have their children removed from the home and, causes, and calls for similar state intervention to stop the harms caused by gamblers, prostitutes, and the drug addicts. Even more broadly, he decides that the uncultivated cannot be competent judges of cultivation. Those who most need to be made wiser and better usually desire it least, and if they desire it, would be incapable of finding the way to it by their own lights. They've got to go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. Now, I'd be a little bit remiss in talking about the harm principle without getting into a little bit of the history of U.S. jurisprudence as it relates to free speech cases. In March of 1919, which is about 100 years ago, wow. Oliver Wendell time Holmes... Time flies, guys. Time does fly. Oliver Wendell Holmes, uh, oh, homie. Mm -hmm. okay. Classic. Yeah. Wind Holmesy. Oh, Windy. Oh, All good nicknames. Oh, Whimsy? Is that oh, Whimsy? That's a good nickname yeah. for... Oh, Whimsy. Supreme Court Justice. Wrote a series of unanimous opinions on three cases upholding the convictions and prison sentences of members of the Socialist Party. These people's crime had been writing and distributing some 15,000 flyers to men who were in the process of being conscripted. The flyers argued that conscription was involuntary servitude and prohibited by the 13th Amendment. Also involved were the court cases of Eugene Debs, a socialist presidential candidate who protested against World War I in a speech. Debs and his his comrades were found to have violated the Espionage and Sedition Acts. In justifying their incarceration, Holmes wrote, Words which, ordinarily and in many cases, would be, would be within the freedom of speech protected by the First Amendment may become subject to prohibition when of such nature and used in such circumstances as to create a clear and present danger that they will be uh, bring about the substantive evils of which Congress has a right to prevent. Free speech. Free speech. <clears throat> Sounds kind of Peterson-y. Sounds a little bit Peterson-y. Now, Holmes went on to write a line that has since become famous. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man in falsely shouting fire in a theater and causing a panic. That's where that comes from. Mm -hmm. I'm going to quote next from an article in the LA Review of Books by Stephen Rode about sort of where, where all this ends after we, we jail all these socialists for uh, mm. free speech that's uh, too dangerous to be allowed. Only eight months later, in November 1919, joined by his protege Justice Brandeis in the case Abrams v. United States, Holmes would signal a dramatic and pivotal shift in his approach to the First Amendment. As recounted in the illuminating essay, Right Skepticism and Majority Rule at the Birth of the Modern First Amendment by Vincent Blasey, Corliss Lamont Professor of Civil Liberties at Columbia Law School, which explains why the year 1919 deserves to inaugurate the free speech century, Holmes' dissent planted the fertile seeds of our modern-day First Amendment jurisprudence. Holmes declared that the ultimate good desired is better reached by free trade and ideas that the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market, and that the truth is the only ground upon which their wishes safely can be carried out. He saw the Constitution as an experiment, as all life is an experiment, but he warned that we should be eternally vigilant against attempts to check the expression of opinions that we loathe and believe to be fraught with death unless they so immediately threaten interference with the lawful and pressing purposes of the law that an immediate check is required to save the country. Okay. This is what he does eight months mm. after... You know, <clears throat> agreeing that those socialists ought to be jailed for saying that drafting people is kind of like slavery. Now, Holmes's views, his new views that he shifted to yeah. after jailing those the socialists. Quick, a quick shift. Yeah, yeah. A yeah. Turnaround. They would be codified in American law 50 years later during the 1969 Brandenburg v. Ohio case. In another unanimous decision, the Supreme Court overturned the conviction of a KKK leader who had led a rally of armed men. These Klansmen okay. had burned crosses and talked about taking revenge against the inwards and Jews that claimed that the U.S. government continues to suppress the white Caucasian race. They announced plans for the 4th of July march on Washington, D.C. In his pure curium uh, opinion for the court, Justice William Brennan wrote, the constitutional guarantees of free speech and free press do not permit a state to forbid or prescribe advocacy of the use of force or of law violation except where an advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. It's interesting to me, when we talk about the history of the evolution of free speech in this country, that when socialists told draftees that being conscripted violated their human rights, that speech was too dangerous to right. be protected. But when white supremacists carried guns and promised to take vengeance on black people and Jews, the Supreme Court decided that's explicitly protected as long as they don't say that vengeance should occur on this exact day. I would say it's unbelievable, but it isn't. <laughs> 
Um, <laughs> laws neat, right? <laughs> yeah, man. So the so the this people is whole, pre- threatening sorry. lives are fine. It this adds up to me. The don't add, but if, if you don't say a date. If I don't say a date. If you don't say a date. Oh. Mm-hmm. Just oh, say, oh, oh, okay. we should take revenge against the Jews. But don't say, we should take revenge against the Jews on July 15th. Okay. That, then That's you're, not, then where you're I going get to jail. Into sticky, so sticky as long waters. as it's not like yeah. an organized flash mob type situation, yeah. then, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Good to know. Cool. You know what else is cool? It is probably. Services? Uh, Wait, uh, uh, is there too? Oh, yeah. There's nah, going to be a service both. or two. I got both. Oh, boy. I, I hope it's a dick pill ad. We mm. really could use some dick pills. Uh, hymns. Great dick pills. Um, hymns? Hymns? Do you hear about yeah. that? There's a new uh, is a drug being developed for, for women, for women uh, to a, ma- uh, make women aroused. Yeah. And, like, that seems like. Um, Incredibly. That seems like a. Complicated. Dan- seems like a, morally. <laughs> seems like a, like, a, like a dangerous kind of. Drug to make available to just like to women. Um, I think it's it, a dangerous drug to make available to men. That's, yeah, that's, yeah, what, yeah. that's, that's, that's what I'm my getting worry. At. I have no issue with women taking a whatever drug. All for women taking control of that. Yeah, uh, I'm concerned about men getting a hold of that drug. I, uh, yes, I hear you. But you know what I'm not concerned with? Services and products. I was going to say just uh, uh, erection drugs in general. Oh, yeah, uh, sure. Because I, I don't know if you guys know this, but the climate is collapsing, and sex is zero emissions. Uh, yeah, sex uh, okay. is on the rise. It's on the rise. It's good. It's good to have. And have some. And with all these horrible facts we read, sometimes it's hard to get an erection. So mm-hmm. well, dick You guys pills. should be worried about do. women slipping their dick, your dick pills into drinks. Mm-hmm. 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 Fear that. Yeah. The one thing I, <laughs> I don't I don't know where to go from here. <laughs> no. I, I ruined it. It's probably going to be a Microsoft ad after this anyway. Which, ooh, perfect. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Talk about a dick mm. pill. One way or the other, buy some dick pills. Mm-hmm. That was a free ad. Don't I Don't be them. Microsoft. Well, oh, well. be oh, macro. Oh, oh, oh. So Damn, good. that was so good. I think we get like like twice as much ad money from that one. We get though, millions of dollars. That now. was a high <laughs> score. <laughs> mm-hmm. Millions of dollars will be like Dr. Jordan Peterson. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to tell people to only eat meat. Oh, I do not want to be like him. <laughs> no, no. All right, go hear some ads. We're back from our <laughs> increasing my, digressions. My wife thinks I'm Jesus. <laughs> Cody's pretending that to be Dr. Jordan uh, Peterson Pete, again. Peter Pern. I've never done it out loud. I'm working on it. So. He's working on it. He's doing it, getting his tight five for Peterson yeah. <laughs> set. Down at the comedy cellar. Mm-hmm. Now, we just talked a little bit about you know the origins of free speech law and how it's evolved over the last century. Yeah. How maybe it's enforced on one side and not mm-hmm. so much mm-hmm. on the other yeah, side. Maybe, maybe it's not. It's sort of forgiven when it's blah, like blah, really, blah. really extreme. And then, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, maybe that's a little When it's weird. related to human rights, it's sort of like... Fuck it. It's like, mm-hmm. look the other way. Yeah, yeah. Now let's talk about the organized and well-funded campaign to make sure freedom of speech continues to evolve in a mm-hmm. very specific direction. Mm-hmm. Freedom of speech law, I should mm-hmm. say. Yeah, just yeah. Just the concept itself. Although, that too. Have y'all ever heard of Brett Weinstein? Sure have. Mm. Oh, good! I was going to bring him up earlier. And here we are. And here we are. All right. He was a biology professor at Evergreen State College who went viral online for opposing a protest that asked white students and faculty to stay home as part of a symbolic protest against white supremacy. Now, he was not fired for this, but he was criticized for his actions. So he resigned, sued the school, and got a bunch of money in a settlement, uh, and then did the rounds talking to Ben Shapiro, Mm -hmm. Joe Rogan, Mm -hmm. David Mm -hmm. Rubin, and the Mm -hmm. other uh, icons of what is now called the intellectual dark web. Mm. Now, another member of the intellectual dark web, and a guest on literally all of those same podcasts, mm. is a guy named Jonathan Haidt, co-author of the Atlantic article, The Coddling of the American Mind. Mm. Oh, yeah. You know Perfect. what I'm building to right now? I feel like probably, yeah. You think you right now? Let's let, 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 you do your thing. Right, we'll see, it. We'll Let's see, get there. We'll Let's see, do it. We'll see, we'll see. <laughs> I, I like using this voice with you. Yeah, it's exciting. It's <laughs> uh, well done. Yeah. yeah. We can do a whole episode like this of our election podcast. I'm going to talk like this to balance it We'll, we'll get you some Thorazine. We'll get mm. Cody and I. What kind of drug makes your voice high? Helium. Helium. Helium right. and Thorazine day. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. <laughs> That's how we do the Autism One Conference episode. Okay. Nailing it. Yeah, Helium yeah, yeah. and Thorazine. We're, we're making plans, we're folks. We're making plans, folks. It's going to be a great podcast. Mm. <laughs> 
let's continue the podcast that we're all the, doing. The current one, yeah. 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 <clears throat> now, the intellectual dark web itself was first coined and defined by Barry Weiss, staff mm-hmm. editor of the New York Times opinion section. Mm-hmm. She has also been a guest on Joe Rogan's mm-hmm. podcast. Mm-hmm. Now, we noted earlier that the claims of that coddling of the American mind article don't hold up to evidence. Mm. Uh, <laughs> four years of college, of course, makes people less supportive of banning any kind of free speech, and young people are more tolerant of offensive speech than older Americans. No matter what academic free speech grifters like Weinstein may claim, the Foundation for Individual Rights and Education found that in 2018, there were a grand total of 18 disinvitation attempts across all colleges and universities in the United States. Not all of those succeeded. Given that young people are more likely to tolerate offensive speech and that college students are less likely to support free speech restrictions than the general population, one is left wondering what all this hubbub arose from. It may have something to do with the fact that Generation Z, or the I generation, is further to the left than any other group in this country. Hmm. 70% of them believe the government should be more involved in problem solving. 62% say racial and ethnic diversity is good for society, compared to 49 and 48% of baby boomers, respectively. That's a good stat. Jump. Yeah. Wow. Now, Generation Z also prefers socialism to capitalism by a marked majority. Mm -hmm. And this, you might expect is terrifying to several small but influential groups in our country. And when I say small, I mean like two guys. <laughs> the Koch brothers. Yes. Yeah, here we go, that baby. That is where it was going. Mm-hmm. Here it come. Here it come, I'd like to quote next from a fantastic article in The American Prospect by Aaron Friedman, which inspired this episode. Quote, Dave Rubin's influential podcast, The Rubin Report, has a financial partnership with Learn Liberty, a think tank started by the Koch-funded Institute for Humane Studies, IHS, where Charles G. Koch himself sits on the board. When the Canadian government denied Jordan Peterson funding for his work, Rebel Media, a group funded with Koch money and headed by Ezra Levant, a far-right Islamophobe with ties to the Koch network, raised cash for him. Peterson has since returned the favor, fundraising for the IHS. Ben Shapiro has collected speaker fees from the Koch-funded Young Americans Foundation and Turning Point USA, and Brett Weinstein was hosted by the University of Wisconsin Stout's Free Speech Week, a project of their Center for the Study of Institutions and Innovations, funded by, you guessed it, the Charles G. Koch Foundation. It's not just the IDW itself. Some of its key popularizers also get Koch funding. Barry Weiss and the Atlantic's Connor Frieserdorf, who has been one of the most visible defenders of Peterson in the mainstream media, have both received cash prizes from the Koch-funded Reason Foundation, where David Koch himself sits on the board of trustees. And remember the coddling of the American mind? Well, one of its co-authors, Greg Lukianoff, is the head of that campus free speech watchdog, FIRE. That organization is funded, of course, by the Koch brothers. For good measure, the Charles Koch Institute also did a laudatory write-up of the piece. Did you mention the Daily Caller? Not yet. Okay. Oh, no. Uh, the da- yeah. They also donate to there. Yeah. The Atlantic is perhaps the worst defender. Last year it launched The Speech Wars, a reporting project that seeks to understand where free speech is in danger and where it has been abused. Even though the magazine had just been bought by billionaire Lorraine Powell Jobs and was seeing all-time high circulation web traffic, The Atlantic solicited funding for the project from none other than the Charles Koch Foundation. Mm -hmm. The Reporters Committee for Freedom of the Press and the Fetzer Institute were also underwriters. When I asked The Atlantic for comment, a spokesperson replied that the editorial control for the series, as with every piece of journalism we create, rests solely with The Atlantic. But the magazine refused to deny that reporters and editors with the speech wars are ever in contact with the Koch Foundation. Editor-in-Chief Jeffrey Goldberg did not respond to my request for comment, and The Atlantic has not disclosed how much money it has received from the Koch Foundation. That's actually pretty surprising for me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the first half, I was like, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. And I was like, wait, what? what? I know. And then what? I... Excuse me? Mm-hmm. That That's... just kept going. Mm-hmm. Wowee. Yeah. Interesting. Ties it all um, together. Yeah, and they're terrified. Yeah. They, uh, they are scared of young folks. They are, I mean, they're like really going uh, yeah. forward with uh, funding a lot of like uh, centrist for the, mm-hmm. and like, uh, yeah, they are they're fucking like, they're terrified really, really, really of really losing, scared. of literally losing like two to four percent of their wealth. Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Richard Fink, president of the Charles G. Koch Charitable Foundation, has explained this whole strategy in talking about his structure of social change philosophy. The basic idea is to spend Koch money in strategic ways to influence broad social change. Fink believes college campuses are one of the most important places to spend money in order to institute changes, and that's why all this is happening. The Kochs and their billionaire friends who help fund their foundation directly to fund the free speech grifters because they see what's coming a generation who wants to take their money and use it for such vile ends as clean water in american cities roads and basic health care they aren't scared on behalf of free speech they're scared on behalf of their bank accounts mm-hmm. this is, this is i mean that's it i, just, I mean that's it right there yeah it reminded right. me um 
you know, the Daily Beast is obviously very liberal. Yeah, I know it's so. the thing. Half the time, not half the time, but every so often you go on there and they've got an article, an ad masquerading as an article mm -hmm. by the Koch brothers. Mm -hmm. They're like, the Koch brothers plan to make a... To you know, improve your, save the world, yeah. to save the world. I think that's actually the headline oh that God. one of them was. <laughs> the Koch brothers plan to save the world. Brought to you by the Koch brothers. The Chelsea Koch Foundation. Very the, upset. Who may be advertising on this episode. Right. Actually. <laughs> like you may, you may, there's a chance. There's yeah. a non-zero chance. Yeah. The, um, it's always, it's, it's always so obvious and interesting and keeps going and going. The, um, the, just the amount of projection from these people. Mm -hmm. um, obviously the free speech thing and the censorship yeah. on campus is, the opposite as we've discussed but then like you have all these people who really go hard in on like george soros is using his billions of dollars mm -hmm. to like de like all the all, all that yeah. kind of stuff but wait that's what but yeah. everyone who's saying that is funded by these you're showing your cards these man brothers like how did you get they? that idea in your head <laughs> is from this... your personal experience and like also like just even if you <laughs> take it on face value like well who's like what are the what's the purpose one is like for humanitarian reasons and one is to protect their money yeah uh it makes me crazy that this age we live in is like not me you not all you yeah it's very frustrating it's very frustrating it's very frustrating very frustrating, very frustrating. <laughs> I love that the media is uh, constantly attacked for being liberal and left-leaning, but even very liberal sites will regularly host op-eds about how yeah. uh, the Koch brothers are great and libertarianism yeah. is good no, and limits wild. on emissions are bad. But you, you, you know what you're not going to fucking see on The Atlantic? You know what you're not going to fucking see in The Daily Beast is like an article on why workers should control the means of production. No, you're not. <laughs> um, um, yeah, maybe. No, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the framing of like the far left media yeah. is just yeah. so frustrating. Yeah. No, what are yeah, you the far left? About? I haven't seen an article about how profits are theft from workers. Yeah, I haven't seen that in a while. I haven't seen anybody. Same thing yeah. Also, like, the media, yeah. I mean, obviously there's a bias against Trump and everything. Mm -hmm. But even at that, even talking about stuff, they're so concerned with not appearing biased that right. they, you know, oftentimes. Yeah. Yeah. It's like the fucking, these people who call themselves fucking journalists, and I want to just punch in the face for even using that word, who like say, look, it may be accurate to call them concentration camps, but like it really offends people. And in order right. in order to have a productive conversation, we should like, that's not journalism, nope. bro. No, no, <laughs> like, that's not, that's not how it works. Journalism is looking outside and being like, oh, hey, it's raining. Mm. Oh, hey, there's a concentration camp. Look at it. Raining. That's a concentration camp. Well, if you Let say me it's describe raining, what I see at this concentration um, camp. It's going to hurt the feelings of all the dry people. Yeah. So Make people jealous. Uh, Hashtag dry pride. I didn't realize Barry Weiss was also funded by the Koch brothers. Yeah, yeah. that was a that surprise is, too. That's a real... Real cool. I didn't realize the Atlantic got Coke money either. I didn't realize that either. That's re I mean, really they've got so disappointing. Much yeah. Yep. Very disappointing. That's wild. Um... This is probably a uh, torpedo in my chances to write an op-ed for the Atlantic. I don't know. It'll be okay. okay. It'll be all right. Just give them some ad money. Yeah, mm -hmm. I'll give them some ad money for yeah. my dick pills. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Just like even separate from a company, just of the concept of of pills that give people erections. Yeah, just That's be like, what hey, I what, advertise. what about that? It's like, what about pills for your dick? Mm -hmm. And then I'll sneak in a line about how uh, if you if you pay attention to the way the economy works, uh, whenever wages rise, the stock market falls because it's fundamentally outside of the interests of the capital mm. holding classes for workers to make more money because that money uh, that goes to them in wages does not go to the uh, stock holding class in, uh, in profits. And as a result, the people who actually own stocks have diametrically opposed interests to everyone listening to this podcast. Uh, dicks pills! <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Penises! They're fun! That's, I love whenever that happens, like, oh, the stock market's on the rise. Like, it, so? so what? <laughs> what kind of like, How many stocks you got, bro? Right, like, why <laughs> like, should any of these people give a shit? Like, <laughs> if I know you, like, you probably have enough money for rent and a couple of six yeah. packs yep. and like yeah you're probably not probably yeah. not gonna if you have you a like... 401k you got it the way i did which is not knowing you had a 401k when yeah. right. like you had that job and you're like oh okay <laughs> yeah. thank, thank you thank you for this thing i didn't understand cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah anyway that's the episode that was a great episode frustrating all the things that are mm -hmm. yeah. to be expected I'm glad i stopped myself from going on uh all right. Various tirades. I'm going to do a dangerous thing, and then I'm going to have you guys plug your way out. I've got the, oh, yeah. uh, the half-smashed uh, LaCroix bottle, and i got yep. my machete. And I'm going to try to hit it into the sounding boards 
uh, as if as if I am batting a tennis ball. Okay. I don't know what kind of ball you bat this way, uh, but I, that's what I'm going to do now uh, for this audio only podcast. Yeah, I made it a decent distance. Didn't hit the sounding boards. Got close. It was fun. Yeah, good time. You could do it again if you practice. You guys want to plug your pluggables? Yeah, you know, uh, check us out. <laughs> we have a podcast called Even More News, and also a YouTube show called Some More News. That's correct. My name's Katie Stoll. You can find me on Twitter at Katie Stoll. My name is Cody Johnston. You can find me on Twitter at Doctor Mister Cody. My That's name CDR. is Katie Johnston and Robert Evans. And actually, you can find me at the internet. Sophie's not here. I am not doing well. At You're doing job. great. You're doing great. <laughs> Thank you. Don't worry about it. She's here in spirit. <laughs> BehindTheBastards.com is our podcast where you can find all the sources for this episode. Uh, you can also find us on uh, tpublic.com where you can buy shirts and cups and that will make someone's stock market price. Someone's stock. Oh, yeah. Some, some stock that. will go, even if it's fucking cotton stocks mm-hmm. anyway. And then everything will be better, as I understand mm-hmm. the stock market. Um, you can find me on Twitter at IWriteOK. Okay. You can find us on Twitter and Instagram at BastardsPod. That's the fucking episode. Go home or... Riot in the streets. One of the two. Goodbye. Patreon.com slash Oh, yeah. For that stock. Too. Oh, yeah. For stock. That's, <laughs> for that's stock the reason. kind of stock I can get behind. Exactly. Stock. <laughs>